Derek Roberts is known worldwide as a cycling historian, and in my humble opinion, he's one of the greatest. Today, he's agreed to talk to us about his cycling life. Derek, what's your first memory of cycling? Well, it must have been when I was about six or seven, I saw a fairy cycle for the first time. And um, I didn't know the lad very well, I didn't even get a ride on it. But I fell in love with this and I started yearning. I didn't even ask my parents whether I could have one because I was quite certain we couldn't afford it. Mm. But um, from then on, I just wanted a bicycle. Yeah. You said that you, you felt, even at that age, that your parents couldn't afford a bicycle. Is it right to, uh, to say that really the bicycle wasn't available to the masses until about 1930 when Hercules broke the price ring? Um, speaking very generally, I should say mm. that's probably true, yes, yeah. yes. I mean, certainly people did buy bicycles yes. from the working class, but the, yes. the cost was, was fairly, fairly high, yeah, wasn't yes. it? Yes, I was, I suppose, I suppose we might have been called lower middle class, mm. and we, <laughs> I suffer from the disease of not, not having two penny, pennies to rub together <laughs> all my working life, but... Yeah. Um, you know, we had um, we had ideas above our station, as it were, because of the um, you know, past associations, domestic associations. Yeah. But money it wasn't there. How did you learn to ride a bicycle? I learned to ride on my cousin's bicycle. She lived up in uh, Yorkshire, in Bentley, near Doncaster. And my mother used to take me up there to stay, stay occasionally. And she had uh, two bicycles, because her father kept a cycle shop. And one was a, a very small lady's bike, a you know, loop frame. And I learned on that. And I would be held up, someone running along behind me. Until one day I was pedalling along and I suddenly realised that no one was holding me up. Yeah. And of course, once you've reached that stage, there's no stopping you. And I graduated to a big bike then. Of course, it's always important that um, you do learn from the start, as it were. Now, when my two children learned their, their bicycles, they, they had bicycles when they were about three, I think. And there was no nonsense of these stabilizers, because they're, they're dangerous. They give them a false sense of security. Oh, and as soon as you take the stabilizers away, they fall off. And if you put a small child on a bicycle, you've only got to hold it for a very short, a short term space of time. And it's, it's away. Mm. And, and once learned, never forgotten. But um, I, I read recently that there's another school of thought on learning, what I might call the Pinkerton School of Thought, <laughs> <laughs> where you, where you lower, lower the saddle and um, use the bicycle as a sort of hobby horse, just paddling along. And um, I, can, I can quite see the value of that. I didn't learn that way, but um, you know, if you, horses for courses. Derek, can you remember what your first bicycle was? The make, etc.? My first bicycle was a Selbach. Now, at the time, I didn't realise what Selbachs were, but um, my cousin was, um, had two, two Selbachs, and he passed one on to me. And um, I just lived for that bicycle from then on. I used to take it to bits almost every week. Yes. Right, right down, I mean take it to bits, right down to the last nut and bolt. Yeah. And then build it up again. But, uh, that was when I was 12, 14, I think. I passed some exam or other. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and that was your, your prize? That was, yes, that was yeah. my reward, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And of course that was a lightweight bicycle, wasn't it? The, oh yes, yes. The cell back. Yes, I used to be able to pick it up with my little finger. Mm. And, uh, and I didn't realise what I had. And and, and what did you do with that bicycle? I mean, what was the, the sort of uses that you put it to? I used it for everything under the sun. I did a lot of cycle camping, and I must have got almost about a hundred weight on it at times, yeah. because I, I always believed in taking everything, including the kitchen stove. And um, it, it stood up to it wonderfully. It was a wonderful machine. And like a fool, I sold it in the end. I got myself a new bicycle, a Russ. Now, looking back, I think it was a mistake, 
because I had the rough, and rust was a beautiful machine. If I'd had any sense, I'd somehow rather kept the cell back as well. What did you use your bicycle for, Derek? Everything. From uh, an errand for 100, 100 yards away to um, riding to work. At one time, I was riding to work at Kensington about eight, six, about six miles away. And um, from then, I, after work, I'd get, go over to Dulles, the Evening Institute. I was a deputy principal there. I kept a suit there. I kept a suit at work. I changed yeah. there. And I'd change back into the cycling togs, go over to Kensington, and um, go over to Dulles, change there, and then change there afterwards and, and cycle home. Um, I'd, before I'd got the, the bike, I'd got access to copies of cycling, and I was very much influenced by Wayfarer, you know, W.M. Robinson, his writings. And I learned from him that um, you should never put anything on your back if you can put it on your bike. So that bike got loaded down. It's, um, we, as I said, we used it for cycle camping, and um, I, I remember at times I was almost up to about a hundred weight on it because I always believed in taking the kitchen stove when I went cycle camping. Derek, you've told us that you used your bicycle for going to the shops and to work and, and uh, etc. Um, where else have you cycled to um, for pleasure? My, really, my experience is somewhat limited. I've, I've cycled as far west as Land's End. I've cycled as far east as Sheerness. I've cycled as far north as Scotland. But I, ha I can't honestly say that I've done extensive touring. I've been to a lot of places. I've been to a lot of places for events and cycled around there. But um, I, never went, I never went overseas, which I regret. You've obviously cycled to a lot of places, Derek. Are there any places that you haven't cycled to that you would like to have done? Yes, I might like to have... Um, emulated the exploits of Alf Lazell, who was a noted tricyclist. And it was his boast that he visited every county in England once during the year. And at the time I thought that was wonderful. Looking back, I'm not at all sure that it was all that wonderful because I, re I found out that at times he would just cycle to a bit place where three counties meet, cycle around and he'd done it. And, um, it reminded me of the words of Johnny Herrick, who was a cycle dealer in Battersea. He said, it's miles, not smiles, and smiles, not miles that count. Mm. And I thought that Alf really had, was getting miles for the sake of getting miles. Yeah. And I never fell victim to that. Of course, it, this is maybe rationalising, maybe I couldn't have done it anyway. Mm. Mm. But, That's probably the the longest ride that you've ever done? 188 miles. My friend and I decided that we we wanted to do a couple of hundred miles in the day, so we set out early one morning and we rode down to the south coast, all along the coast, around the edge of the Thames and came back. And um, about six or seven miles from home a car came along with blazing headlights and dazzled me so completely that I went in a ditch and I got out again and by the time I got home I found we'd done 188 miles well we had half an hour left so Glenn went off and did another to another 12 to finish which was more than half an hour he did another 12 to finish but um, I wasn't feeling up to it, so I stuck, went straight to bed. And 188 it stayed, I never, never did more than that. Who was the most memorable person that you've met through cycling, Derek? Um, one or two, yes. I've, uh, my immediate, um, immediate um, circle, as you might say, is it was Charles Bartle, 
who was um, not internationally known. At one stage he was nationally known, but um, he was an outstanding gentleman. I also met um, Teddy Southcott, and I remember something he said that um, I realised the truth of years on. He said, we're all right until we get to 80 and then we start going to pieces. <laughs> and having reached the age of 83, I don't know exactly what he meant. But the person I suppose that really was the most outstanding was George Herbert Stancer. Now I met him only once at a, a meeting of the Fellowship of the Old Time Cyclists, but um, to quote Shakespeare, he strode the world like a colossus. I think he had probably more influence on the world of cycling than almost anyone else. Bindake was another one. The, those two, their, their writings, and of course Robinson. But of the three, I think the, the really great one was Stancer. George Stancer, yeah. You mentioned Charlie Bertel. Can you tell us a little bit about him and his records and what sort of a chap he was, you know? Charlie was a chap that would go for anything. He was one of the most modest men I've ever met. I remember at one of our luncheons, um, he, Alfie West stood up and was talking about his records. He'd been an, an international cyclist and he'd done, he'd done some record breaking and he was generally telling us how good he was. And then Afterwards, I knew that Charles was sitting there, and I said, well look, we have among us someone who set up a, an hour tandem paced tricycle record umpteen years ago, and it's still standing, it's still standing today. Yeah. I said, perhaps he'd like to tell us something of his own. And up Charlie got, and he said, well of course, mine were only toffee apple records. <laughs> now that was typical of Charles. Um, it was. Frank South, I used to say, I'll have a basin full of anything. Charles said, I'll have a bash at anything. He went for anything. He was a member of the Norwood Paragon team that was so effective. Uh, the two Southalls, Ch Charlie Hallaback and Charles Bautle. And they were an outstanding club team. And Charles made up the four and he made up the numbers time and time again. Mm. He was always thereabouts. He never got quite to the top, but um, he gave a lot of pleasure to a lot of people while he was doing it. Yes. Uh, on Charlie, yep. he's one of the few people I can say, I never heard anyone say anything against him. Mm. And I'm not exaggerating, and that's, mm. that's very rare. You've said many times, Derek, that when you introduce competition or achievements, uh, people find ways of cutting corners or bending the rules just to achieve these things. I didn't realise that when I f founded the Southern Veteran Cycle Club. And um, I was not, not all that young, but I was fairly young. And I, you know, I had the com comp competitive spirit and it wasn't long before I realised that that was going to work against what I was hoping for with the, the VCC. Um, in the first in the first year you see when um, I had the England sh Shield, the England Trophy that was given to me by England uh, as a a reward for founding the club and I gave it to the club and um, it was then the committee decided they'd award it to the chap who'd done most for the club during the, it was a chap then because the girls weren't doing anything mm. the chap who'd done most for the club during the year and of course it means <laughs> they handed it straight back to me because I, it was a one man band mm. yeah. and um, that I think taught me that this was not going to do any good because as far as I could see no one else would have the opportunity to do what I was doing mm. so I said look in future this let's have it this goes with the chair the president every year and so that was that 
And then later on, there was the question of the um, of the boot and back bash, the five mile so-called race that we held in Hertfordshire. And that was envisaged as a, a fun ride. Mm. And originally it was going to be a, a handicap with sealed handicaps, which were shuffled and handicapped, handed out at random before the start. So you might find someone finishing in five hours, another one finishing before he started. Yeah. <laughs> but um, that never, they didn't like that. And the, the, the must win at all costs. Yeah. Yeah. But it has, I must confess that on the whole, it's been kept down. We did have trophies awarded Concours d'Elegance, and um, I managed to stop that. Mm. You know, it's, 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 it, it doesn't do in a cup. I, I think, and I'm sure that these are your words, I think that you summed it up in the uh, original set of rules where you said that the club does not encourage competition because sooner or later it leads to divisiveness. Oh yes, yes. And I, I think it was beautifully put and it's something that I've I've been very pleased to learn and uh, I've, I've kept it to the forefront of my mind and um, certainly it's I think it's been the cornerstone of the Veteran Cycle Club which was of course the Southern Veteran yes, Cycle yes. Club. Um, well, right, we'll, we'll there was one Veteran Cycle Club who shall be nameless where as a result of some argument over some competition half the club didn't speak to the other half for a whole year. For part of your cycling life Derek you've been married and you've had a family um, how has the family and cycling got on together? Well, um, when I married Peggy, she was um, she could ride a bicycle, but um, she was one of the, one of the um, she was of the school of thought that uh, believed that when you were going uphill, you changed into top gear because your feet didn't have to go around so fast. <laughs> but um, she <laughs> she adapted. And um, we did one or two tours in the, in the Cotswolds and the West Country. And then when the girls came along, we had um, a twin sidecar and went riding with the CTZ family section. And then later on, I got a triplet and we had um, one, one on the back and one on the little seat in front of Peggy. But um, the girls were never really interested in cycling mm. and I, I didn't believe in forcing it down Done. their throats mm. because I'd seen that uh, with others and um, so they, they didn't follow up. But otherwise, our, our cycling was really confined to veteran cycle events. The sidecar you mentioned, um, was that on a solo or on a tandem? A tandem, tandem, yes. Presumably it was a Watsonian. Yes, yes it was, yes. Watsonian sidecars are ones that are best known to people, but there were many other makes, weren't there, Derek? Oh yes, I think probably the most um, familiar to the the club was the Fenton Zip. Mm. But um, I was never keen on that. You see, with the Watsonian, you, you um, the tandem canted over. Right. With the Fenton Zip, it didn't. You were upright. And um, going around the left-hand bend, you slowed down. Mm. It, it wouldn't have worried me much because I'd had a, spe a spell of motorcycling with a sidecar. But um, <laughs> it's always it's always hard to remember the theory. If you're going to you take a sidecar and chair around the left-hand bend fast. And you, then you have to remember, I must open up and not slow down. <laughs> and it sometimes takes a bit of doing if you're going too fast anyway. Yeah. After all of this time, Derek, why have you continued to cycle? Well, because cycling became a way of life for me. It coloured my whole existence and my whole way of thinking. And even when I was motorcycling and, and car driving, I still found myself thinking as a cyclist. Mm. Um, and my attitude really came, became consolidated in um, 1955 when my brother and I founded the Southern Veteran Cycle Club. And I found myself 
then having to edit a magazine and do the secretary's job and the treasurer's job. You see, there were six of us at the first meeting, and um, I thought that I was going to do the secretary, and my brother, who'd been editing the, editing the um, university magazine, who'd be editor. Mm -hmm. But it turned out that he was too busy. <laughs> so I had, I had done no editing before then. And after, as I say, I found I was the editor, and I was also the secretary, and um, no one else wanted to be the treasurer, so I had the treasurer. So I did, carried on for 10 years. Then when the Fellowship Old Time Cyclists um, found that they needed a secretary, Harry England, editor of Cycling, died. And they were um, bereft of their secretary because he provided the secretarial work. And I'd been invited as a representative of the Southern for some time. And they asked me whether I'd take on the secretaryship. So I took on the secretaryship. And I found that some of these old boys, they were, they were getting on, they almost lived for their annual meetings. It was twice yearly to begin with, and then it had to die down to once yearly. But they were so keen on it. For instance, Marcel Plains, who held the uh, mileage records, mm. um, his wife told me that he used to get all agitated for about a week beforehand, before the meetings, and before the, um, the Ripley runs of the Southern. And I thought, well, these old boys, they used to joke about their dying out as they, the annual meetings. They got fewer and fewer and say, ha ha, we shall be here next year. Yeah. <laughs> and I thought, well, there must be a lot more people like that who want to be in touch. So I suggested that um, they might find former, found a similar organisation. I asked the FOTC whether they minded, mm. because it would be cashing in their, on their um, preserves, as it were. And they didn't mind. So we called a meeting, and in 1965, the Fellowship of Cycling Old Timers was formed. And um, I thought, now, there's going to be a minimum age of 65 for this, at least. And um, as it turned out, there were some people there that wanted to join, and they were only 50. So 50 was the minimum age. Mm -hmm. I thought, well, that's right, they left me out. But they passed a special resolution enabling me to become the secretary and editor and treasurer. <laughs> so So you've now got two jobs. So I had I had the two jobs, yes. Yeah. Can can you just explain to us the, what the difference is between the fellowship of cycling old timers and the fellowship of old time cyclists? The fellowship of old time cyclists was formed in nineteen sixteen. His membership was open to anyone who'd ridden a high bicycle or a tricycle before 1890. Originally, they had to have been born before 1872, mm. but they dropped that requirement. Well, obviously, it was um, self self ending. Yeah. And um, when I say I had three, I, I had three jobs because yes. I was still running the FMOTC, and the last one died in 1871. Mm. But of course, uh, it's. But the Fellowship of Cycling Old Timers was just open to anyone cycling, active or past cyclists, interested in cycling. Over 50 years old. Over 50 or over. Mm. Mm. Derek, why do you dislike the term penny farthing? Well, like, um, like many other people, I, knowing no better, did occasionally refer to a penny farthing in my errant youth. But um, contact with the old... FOTC members, I learned from them that um, the epithet came about from the London gutter snipes of about 1890, and they used to call jeeringly after people who were riding the obsolescent high bicycle, yarl penny farthing. And of course it has acquired a pejorative sense in um, Harold Wilson referred to a penny farthing economy when he was talking about the Labour Party finances, and he was sneering. So when I hear penny farthing, there, I hear a sneer in the tone, you know, oh. only a penny farthing. And um, 
as I say, I, I took the attitude of the, the people that were around at the time. Mm. They didn't like it. They found it very Just as um, they found offensive the use of the push bike. Mm. Um, Do you, it's very much like calling a veteran car an old croc, isn't it? Oh, yes. Now, there's, a, there's an example. You see, once upon a time, the London to Brighton car, veteran car rally was known as the old crocs race. Mm. And the veteran car club set their, their face against it. And I don't know how they did it, but they managed to stop it. You never hear the old crocs race referred no. to now. So in 1965, you'd already got other club jobs, but you started up a brand new publication, Fellowship News. Yes, yes. That, that yes, was brand yes. new. And, and this was made up from contributions of members. Yes, yes. Okay. And like the early bone shakers, it was stenciled here, it was run off here, it was stapled here, and it was sent out from yeah. here. With Peggy's help, I Oh, yes, of course. Yeah. Oh, none of this would have been possible without Peggy. No. The, no, the Southern Veteran Cycle Club couldn't have existed without her help. Yes, I'm, I'm sure that's true. So it started with, what, a dozen, two dozen, 50 members, roughly? Um, was, yes, round about that. That, that sort yes, of number. Yes. And it presumably grew fairly well. Yes, it did, it did, yes. And it must at some time have become almost unmanageable and called for superhuman effort. But um, when did Jim Shaw um, uh, get involved and, and what sort of part did he play? Well, when I decided that I'd have to unload some of it, I advertised and um, Jim replied and I decided that he was the man to do it. And uh, <laughs> how right I was, mm. because he he revolutionised things. He took well, he took what I had. See, I was still working on the the card index and everything like that. Mm -hmm. You know, in the, in the pen and pencil stage. And he went on to computerising it, and uh, he he had to learn it himself. When he started, he he didn't know how to use a computer, mm. but he got a computer and he got it all on computer. I couldn't possibly run the thing now. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> because. I mean, twi when the, twice in the old days when the Southern were up against it, I came back to the Secretary's job on two occasions and the, um, the Treasurer's job, but um, of course I couldn't, couldn't cope now. No, because uh, the, the sheer size yeah. of it. Now Jim brought it all in to up to date, and of course anyone can organise anything in the Fellowship, and there have been little offshoots, there have been various clubs. There's the Thursday Club, for instance. Mm -hmm. They meet each Thursday and ride. And little, little groups, there's the... Um, it's the October weekend, the, isn't it? Yes, yes. That sort of thing. Yes, they... Yes, it's, it's given a lot of people a, you know, an interest in life. Have you ever raced or been involved in cycle racing? No, only as I mentioned in the boot and back bash mm -hmm. on <laughs> one memorable occasion, I beat Bob Hardy by I think about one second or something. <laughs> he often rem remembered it. Um, interesting about the boot and back, there was a trophy in the early days. It was a beautifully painted chamber pot. I don't know who provided it, but it was around for a couple of years, but um, someone who thought it was rather vulgar smashed it. Oh. And then Bob Hardy had a little um, high bicycle, I think made in stainless steel or something, mm. and presented that. And that was a mistake. Bob Hardy did make one or two mistakes, not many, but he, that was a mistake, mm. because the other exemplified what the, the boot and back was about That's right. and that made it too much of a, a reward for a race. Derek, is this where the Southern Veteran Cycle Club was formed? Yes, this is the very room. On 14th of February 1955, Alex Bear, Horace Achard, Pop Maynard, Derek Powell, my brother John and I formed the 
a veteran cycle club. Originally we were going to call it the Veteran Cycle Club. And um, it was Alex Bear pointed out that you couldn't do that because there were other veteran cycle clubs and it would be insufferably arrogant of our part to call it the Veteran Cycle Club when there were others preceding us. Mm -hmm. Why John and I have forgotten that, I don't know, because um, we, we knew about the um, Peterborough. Peterborough and um, the other one, Co Coventry. The Coventry one. Yes. Yeah. At any rate, we um, then decided that we were going to call it um, the South Eastern Veteran Cycle Club because that um, covered the London Worthing. You know. And then I said, well, look, there's Brian Walker who lives over in Bristol, Bristol Way. He was a noted illustrator of um, cycling books at the time. I said, he's interested in joining. So we'll call it the Southern. So it became the Southern Veterans Cycle Club. And over the years, it acquired a certain fame or notoriety, whichever you like, under that name. Mm. And the idea that um, we could call it the Veterans Cycle Club and cock a snook at the other ones is um, something that we thought of at the time. Because mm. it wasn't very long before you would got members in the Midlands. Jim Bolton, of course, joined yes, yes. very early on. Now, you said, didn't he used to send you a postal order or something? That's right. Every time the magazine arrived, he sent a half a crown postal order because he, th he thought it was worth it. Yeah. Apart from his sub. As secretary, treasurer and the editor of the magazine, you played a major part in the organisation of the SVCC. Um, well, I edited the magazine for 21 years. Mm -hmm. I was the editor, I was the secretary, I, I think it was about five years. Something like that. I'm the treasurer. And as I've said, I went back once or twice to step in when mm. the That's right. people disappeared. Uh, I think there's something else about the now Veteran Cycle Club, not THE Veteran Cycle Club, but just simply Veteran mm -hmm. Cycle Club, um, that's important. Uh, the President only holds that office for a short time, mm -hmm. and we're not stuck with one particular President, if mm -hmm. that's the word for it. Is, is there a particular reason for yes. that? Yes. In the early days, we recognised that there were not going to be many of us and there was jobs to be done. And we thought, well, we're going to have a working president and we'll have a working vice president if we must have these two offices. Uh, we had a president because you, you had a, a president in anything connected with cycling. Mm. But we, we accepted that there would be a rotating. More than one person would hold the job on more than one occasion. But the idea was that he, he or she was a working president. There was none, none of the figure. We set our faces resolutely against figureheads of any sort. Uh, uh. Um, it worked on the whole pretty well until some time later there were, there were uh, <laughs> one or two people did get put in who couldn't do the president job. You see, Peggy always refused to be the president because she said, I can't, I can't run a meeting, so I'm not going to do it. Well, that didn't deter one or two other people from mm. doing it in the future. And um, we adopted the principle that the vice, the, the vice president should follow on as president. Mm. You know, Give, uh, given them a, yes, a sort yes, of leading yes, to yes, the job. Yes. Yeah. I think you've been president twice, haven't you? Yes, I have, yes. At least twice. Yes, once um, when it was our um, silver jubilee. Silver, silver jubilee. That's right. And I forget what the other occasion was. Something they decided I ought to be president. Mm. <laughs> Derek, tell us about the president's shield that H H England gave to the club. Um, that was originally pre presented by Dr. E. L. Turner, who was a noted um, tricyclist. He held the the mile record, or, sorry, our solid tyre tricycle record at Herne Hill for some years. Um, he was presented to um, the winner of the race between the houses from Ditton 
to Ripley. And um, it was won by A.L. Bower, mm -hmm. who was later Lord Mayor of London. Now there's a connection there with um, Charles Bowtell, because when A.L. Bower was Lord Mayor of London, he had a, a cycling theme in his um, Lord Mayor's procession and Charles Bowtell was in it. When did cycling history first interest you, Derek? I can't remember why, but not long before I married Peggy, um, I acquired three or four old books on cycling. <laughs> took, them, <laughs> took them on the honeymoon, <laughs> past the time. And um, I think my interest in cycling grew from then on. But it didn't really reach fever pitch until John and I visited Wally Angel's collection of old cycles at Diamond Inn near Luton. And we were cycling home and we stopped by in the lee of a, way, a haystack, I remember, and we had thermos of hot soup. And we decided it might be possible to have a, a club devoted to these, this sort of thing, these veteran cycles. And um, I, I was thinking on the lines of the London to Brighton car, veteran car run. I thought that might be a possibility. And John, who, as I said earlier, had, was edit, had been editing his um, university magazine, thought it, we ought to have a magazine. And he had an idea which I thought at the time seemed you know, most unusual. He said, we can put a real photo of about an old, old bicycle in every time. Mm. And I thought at the time, where the heck are we going to get those from? At any rate, we started out with that idea. And um, strangely enough, although I found myself landed with it, um, it came into being. And um, in the next room to this, the bone shaker was stenciled, stapled. The magazine, the photographs were obtained and stapled in the back, and they were dispatched at the post office down the road. Mm. And how soon was that after the inaugural meeting in February of 1955? When did your first issue roll off the press? 1956, I think it was. Oh, yeah. So it, it really, it was, it was quite soon. Oh, uh, yes, yes. Uh, yes, but you see, I realised, I soon found that I was, I, I was editor. Well, as a, with a lot of cycling magazines, it doesn't mean you edit, it means you write the flaming thing. Right, yes. And I found myself having to write on cycling history. Now I told you I had one or two old books and I had some articles in cycling. And as long as I sort of churned these out, I thought it would be all right. And I thought, well, I don't know, I'm taking a lot of this on trust. And um, I soon found that my trust was occasionally misplaced. So I thought, well, somehow or other, I've got to learn something about this. So I tried to learn as much as I could. And I thought at the same time, well, I'm going to say things here that are wrong. And I'd better start as I mean to go on. And where I discovered that I said something that is wrong, I must say it was wrong on the earliest possible occasion. Mm. And um, I've tried to stick to that throughout my writing career, such as it's been. It... Uh, it, it must have been quite gratifying then to find out that the club, with the, uh, the the push from Andrew Millwood, decided to reprint the early copies of the Bone Shaker, which were, mm. by virtue of the fact it was a very small club, there were only a very few of them about, yeah. and you were asked to, <coughs> to re-edit them, if yes. you like, and, and make yes. the correction. Yes, yes, it was very pleasing. It was very pleasing, yes. Sort of rewrite history almost, yes, yes, yes. which is a good thing. Um, yeah. And then, when did News and Views separate from the Bone Shaker or, or become as a separate well, that, entity? Well, that started as Secretary's Notes. You see, I, I was thinking of my time with the Fellowship of Old Time Cyclists where I got a little newsletter. And I thought, there's stuff that we want to get to the members. And it doesn't need to go in the bone shaker because I was my idea 
was that the bone shaker should be confined to history. Mm -hmm. Club chat, we need something else. So we had secretary's notes. Mm -hmm. And that developed into news and views. Jimmy Atkinson thought up the site title News and Views. And um, I edited that for some time. Derek, I've known you through the world of cycle history, but I know that you've got other interests, like cooking. Yes. When, um, when I was still alive and at work, we were, as a family, I used to do the cooking at Christmas. And then when I retired, I took over the cooking altogether. Peggy was, Peggy was still at work and um, mm -hmm. you know, it gave her, gave her a bit of relief. Besides, I enjoyed doing it. <laughs> Have you had any major disasters in your culinary experiences? Um, no burnt turkeys or...? <laughs> no, no, I, I can't. Okay. Okay. I can't, possibly, um, you know, mercifully old age has made me forget them, but I can't, yeah. I can't remember any. Now, what about books, Derek? Books obviously have been a big part of your life. Yes, I have lived for books from the earliest days. I'm one of those people that proverbially can't see a, a cereal packet without reading everything on it. And it's literally true. Mm. If I go in a second-hand bookshop, I come across a row of paperbacks and I start licking I find the corner turn up and I'll turn it down again. <laughs> you know, well, books to me have acquired an importance that there's, they really ought not to have. But, uh, uh, are there any particular writers that have inf influenced you? I remember reading an article, a book by Quilla Cooch. He's not read, not read very much nowadays. But I can remember feeling a wave of pleasure come over me at the beautiful way he'd, he'd written it. And of course, H.G. Wells, Bernard Shaw, people like that in the early days, they were my staple diet. You've developed a particular style of writing, Derek, which can be best described as boiling it down. You're able to use the minimum amount of words to get the maximum effect. Well, I, I try, I try. <laughs> as a matter of fact, I'm sometimes accused of being rather f flowery and uh, I have a habit of being deliberately flowery, sort of ironically. Yeah. And it never works because people think <laughs> you don't know any better. Besides cycling and books and cooking, there's obviously been lots of things that have taken up your time and have been interest to you. Can you tell us about those, please? Politics. I've been a political animal all my life. Um, animal welfare. Um, and of course, in my earlier days, very much amateur dramatics, because my mother and all her sisters were on the stage, and a lot of our close friends and acquaintances and relations were. And I grew up accepting the stage as a sort of atmosphere. And I went into amateur dramatics when I was about 15, I think it was. And I stayed doing that for many years. And um, a very great friend of my cousin's was um, a stage manager actor. I don't know whether you've ever heard of the American actress Ruth Draper. She used to come over from the States every mm -hmm. year, did a one-woman show, and he was stage manager for her. And he was um, producing a pl uh, French Without Tears by Rattigan down at the Penge Empire, not so far away. And his young leading man dropped out at the last minute for some reason, I forget why. And um, he came to me and said, would I do it? 
Now this, <laughs> this is a bit momentous because um, we were a one-parent family. My father had departed when I was about 13 or 14 and I had just started work and um, if you ask most theatrical people whether they want their children to go on the stage and there's the reply to Mrs Worthington, don't put your daughter on the stage. Yeah. My mother and my aunt who was living at home thought it would be madness for me to do it. And I don't know whether I was right or wrong, but I turned it down. Looking back, I think it was cowardice on my part. Because I'd have loved to have done it. But um, on the other hand, if I, hadn't, if I had done that, I don't think there'd be the veteran cycle movement there is today. Why did you start writing about cycle history, Derek? Yes, well, I, I didn't want to start writing about it in the beginning. My idea was that I would edit and people would come and fill, fill the magazine with articles. But uh, I found that, as many editors of cycling magazines have found, that you have to write most of it yourself. And as I was writing something, I wanted to make sure that it was right. So I started to learn, and I was... I was learning, trying to keep pace with what I was producing, trying to keep a step ahead of what I was writing. And once the, um, the writing bug really bit, I, you know, it, I was I was inoculated. I couldn't get rid of it. Have you made any major discoveries in cycle history? Dan? No, I can't can't honestly say that there has been. What I think I've achieved is to make people think twice about accepting what's written down because um, a lot of the things that I took for granted when I started I found later weren't, weren't so and even Sammy Bartley who is one of the foremost historians occasionally made some howlers and um, I followed in his suit I made some howlers myself but um, all the time you have to be you have to remember that um, you're, it's not necessarily the last word what you're writing at the time. Take the take the recent um, controversy over the Michaud invention. I mean, it was accepted for years that um, Henri Michaud thought of the idea of fitting pedals and cranks to the front wheel of a of a Dresden. And um, Ernest Michaud, his son, built the thing. And recently, um, it's been claimed that um, he didn't do anything of the sort. It was Lallemand, Pierre Lallemand, who went to America, had done it. Well, the research, mainly undertaken by Roland Sauvage, has comprehensively disproved that. And the um, Michaud has been restored to his rightful place. But you now have the position where a lot of people in the veteran cycle movement have the false idea that um, Lallemand was really the inventor. And of course he wasn't. He was merely a copier. How do you see the study of cycle history in the future, Derek? I'm, I have to confess, I'm a bit despondent about the future. I think the whole veteran cycle movement has taken a bit of a wrong turn. For instance, the institution of the... Um, the International Veteran Cycle Club, I think, displays um, symptoms of delusions of grandeur. There is not the not the base, not the foundation for such a grandiose idea. And um, although the first international cycle symposium was quite a good idea, it, that again has got out of hand. You see, the only only point of having these meetings where people present papers is if those papers are discussed by the um, movement at large. And all that happens is that you get these meetings which are held here, there and everywhere in the world, which means that only a few people can afford to, to go there. And um, very expensive papers are produced that 90% of the membership don't bother to read. 
and it's a little coterie talking to themselves, mm. doing nothing really to spread the gospel. I'm, I'm a bit despondent. From what you have said, can you give us any tips or hints on how to get to the truth of cycle history? I think it would be presumptuous for me to try to do so. You see, I recognise that I represent a bygone era, as it were, and what um, what worked for me wouldn't work for people today. For instance, today you have things like the internet, and I suspect that um, there will be work done on the internet. I believe movements, movements are already afoot on that. Well, that leaves me cold. I, I couldn't cope with that. But um, I suggest that people ought to do a bit more research among the fundamentals. Now, take an example. Some time ago, there was um, a suggestion that um, Macmillan didn't invent the bicycle in 1839 or 40, as we've uh, brought up to believe. And there was a, a photograph of a Scotsman with a kilt on a tricycle published in News and Views. And in News and Views there was a caption that it, um, this chap was possibly Macmillan on his tricycle. Um, later there was a reference to it as that was Kirkpatrick Macmillan on his tricycle. No suggestion there was any f um, fallibility about it. And um, the idea that he didn't build a bicycle at all, they do accept that he possibly built a tricycle. Now, there's a Macmillan study booklet, and it is loaded with all the information that was available over the years that I was doing that work. As far as I can understand from the, um, the keeper of the books, the people that have been arguing about Macmillan haven't bothered to refer to that mine of information. They are just working quite independently. Mm and you can't do that. And you see, another, another point that uh, struck me not so long ago, the curator of the Dumfries Museum told me years ago that um, there's a tradition in the McCall family who um, can trace themselves back to the, the McCall who built the copies, that when he was a schoolboy, he came across Macmillan's bicycle standing in the curb, and he made detailed notes of it and he wrote them down. And he later built the copy from those notes. Well, if he did that, why was it that all his copies were bicycles and not tricycles? Mm. Mm. You see, the, the two don't match. And no one seems to be bothering to try to match them. There doesn't seem to be any attempt at an overall view, which, however inadequately, I did try to do when, when, I, was, when I was running. Now, on a lighter note, what would you do if you won the lottery? What I'd do with the money is uncertain. What I'd do immediately, I know quite well. First of all, I should settle down and make a list of how much was going to be given and to whom. That is very important. The next thing I'd do was to summon the immediate family and sit down and discuss what ought to be done with it because obviously at my time of life, whatever I do is not going to be of much use to me, but um, it's going to affect other people. And it will be unfair of me to make decisions that would affect people you know, from beyond the grave. Mm. So that, that's what I do. I don't want much now. There's nothing really that I want. No. Not even a nice computer that would link you with the internet. Oh, yes, <laughs> yes, I should. Um, Yes, I should probably, possibly buy, buy a, light, a slightly larger house with a room for a, internet and everything and hire someone to teach me how to use it and then I could play to my heart's content. Do you have any regrets? Yes, they're selfish regrets in a way. I regret that in the days when I was churning out quite a lot of stuff, I didn't have the facilities that are available today. For instance, in the bone shaker, all the all the early illustrations had to be done by hand, and I'm no artist. I couldn't um, 
any if I wanted something copied, it had to be photographed and then drawn from that. And it was not only slow, it's fabulous, it's fantastically expensive. And as I said before, <laughs> we were we were not living from hand to mouth, but um, there was no money to spare at any time. In fact, looking back again, it's, it's a mistake that I did try to run the machine, the organisation on the shoestring. For instance, the the first year, the sub for the Southern Veterans Cycle Club was five shillings. But um, people who joined in the second year, if they joined in the first, they came in for one and ninepence. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it seemed fair at the time, looking back, it's <laughs> absolute madness. Mm. Because you see, who was it? Mark, was it Mark Twain said that if you've once been poor, you're poor all your life. And there's a lot of truth in that. Mm. I mean, now, of course, uh, I'm, I'm going to worry about money. Uh, that is until I have to go into a home. Um, you know, it, it seems it seems stupid that um, there you are. That's what I say. I did things, and of course, if only I'd had a cop access to a copy, a photocopier. I mean, I can produce Fellowship News now, and enjoy doing it because it's it's a labour of love, and not done from a love of labour as that had to be. I mean, you can photocopy anything and reproduce it. But in the early days, oh dear, oh dear. So I do, I really do regret that. Shortage of money and lack of facilities mm. to producing the sort of magazine that I always had in my mind I wanted to produce. Derek, we'd like to thank you and Peggy for your hospitality and time today. But moreover, for your dedication to finding the truth about cycle history over the past 45 years. Well, thank you for those words. All I can say is that if what I have tried to do has been appreciated, then I'm very glad. <laughs>